Hey everyone, welcome back. My name's Diana. This is my channel, Bookish Die, and today I'm wrapping up my July in reading. So overall, July was kind of an odd month for me. So I did read 11 books, five of which I talked about in a separate blog, so I won't go too in depth here. But I also had four DNFs, and it's because of the project I, that I was doing for that blog, where inspired by Mara from books like Whoa, I chose a stack of books from my TBR shelf and read the first chapter or two to see if the book captured my interest. And then of the books that did read until I either decided to DNF or I finished the book. And so because of that, I had way more DNFs than I normally do. So I'm not going to talk too in depth about the books that I, I that I either read or DNF for that project. So I'll just sum them up now and then I'll go into the other books that I read for July because I did have some other things that I read and enjoyed that I want to talk about. So to start with my DNFs, like I said, I had four. First, Tarnished Are the Stars by Rosie Thorne, then Scavenge the Stars by Tara Sim, followed by Candle in the Flame by Nafisa Azad, and finally, Sweet and Bitter Magic by Adrian Tooley. If you want to find out why I ended up DNFing these books, I highly recommend watching the vlog. Um, all of the information is there. And then of the books that I finished for the vlog, uh, what they are and what I rated them, Shatter the Sky by Rebecca Kim Wells. This is a 3.25. Bell, Revol Bell Revolt by Lindsay Miller. This is a 3.5. Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything by Raquel Vasquez Gilland. This was a 4.5. Whole Metal Girls by Emily Skretsky. This was a 2.75 and probably uh, my least favorite book of the month. Actually, it, it definitely is my least favorite book of the month. And finally, Anger is a Gift by Marco Shiro. Again, if you want to see the reasons why I rated those books the way that I did, why I thought Whole Metal Girls was particularly disappointing, all of that is in the vlog. So to go into the remaining six books that I read this month, the first was There Will Be Fire, Margaret Thatcher, The IRA, and Two Minutes That Changed History, written by Rory Carroll, narrated by John Keating. So this is a book documenting the IRA's attempt to assassinate Margaret, or Margaret Thatcher at the Conservative Party convention conference in Brighton in the 1980s. This book talks about the history of the IRA. It talks about the history of Ireland breaking free from the British Empire minus the six counties that make up Northern Ireland and the goals of the IRA as well as going into what some of the British thought was in terms of their attempts to keep and control the, the Irish population. So this book follows mostly the man who created and planted the bomb, whose name I'm completely blanking on at the moment. But so it goes into his life, how he joined the IRA, how he got trained as a bomber, and how one of his attempts to kind of leave the IRA and make an, make a different life for himself elsewhere in Europe was derailed by the fact that the British tracked him down and threw him in prison. And so he's like, you know, I might as well just keep doing what I'm doing. And he was one of the members of the England department. So people who would go and plant bombs and just kind of what their rationale, like their methodology was. And it also goes into, don't you dare jump up on that cat. Sorry. Um, Leia has the dog on her today. Uh, so it goes into that. It talks about Margaret Thatcher's election. It talks about uh, the aftermath of the bombing and British attempts to find the bombers. And overall, it was, a, and it was an enjoyable nonfiction book. I, had, I don't know too much about the Troubles. I think my main exposure is Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keefe, which I highly recommend, as well as some stuff that's been on Dairy Girls and things that I've picked up here and there. So this was something where I was somewhat aware that the IRA had attempted to kill Margaret Thatcher, but I didn't know too much about it. So I thought that was interesting. I did think that the book subtitle, The Bombing That Changed His or The Two Minutes That Changed History, wasn't quite on the nose. So it does talk about how what happened with the bombing changed the British security apparatus around politicians. 
and it does touch a bit on what Margaret Thatcher did afterwards but I felt like that was more that that part of the title was more to draw people in so yeah I would say check this out if it's if you're interested in learning more about the Troubles, uh, the IRA, the British occupation of, Nor of Northern Ireland, and what was going on there, I gave it four stars. I did like the audiobook a lot. So if you get, if you find nonfiction works best for you in audio, I'd recommend it. Then I continued my Kate Daniels journey and read Magic Breaks. So this is book seven in the Kate Daniels series, and it picks up relatively soon after book six where Kate and Kieran and other members of the pack went to Europe and they met Hugh and things happened. So this carries a lot of the through lines and it also to a certain extent serves as an ending point to uh, Kate to part of Kate and Kieran's arc but also also kicks off a different component. And so with this book Kate is trying to solve a pro solve a potential crisis between the packs so or the shapeshifters of Atlanta and the necromancers because one of the leaders of the necromancers has been found dead and all signs point to the pack and so she needs to figure out what's actually going on how does it how do i stop it and also deal with the fact that Hugh has a really good idea of who who she is who her what her lineage is and how that might impact her so I loved this. I think this might be my favorite Kate Daniels book so far. We have so many great relationships, not just between her and Kieran, but other members of the pack. Um, we get to see more of the world outside of Atlanta. We get Kate being like, I'm tired of Hugh being alive, which, you know, same bestie, same. Um, we have just things are changing. The status quo is no longer the same. And I can't go too into it uh, because it does get very spoilery. But I thought how the book ended made me really excited for the final three books in the series. So I gave this a 4.25 out of 5. Definitely my favorite of the series so far. And I'm so excited to see what happens to Kate next. Then for something very different, I read Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation by Kristen Cobes Dumez. So I kind of got in a little bit of a hyper fixation on watching like cult and fundy documentaries. Um, I watched Shiny Happy People, which is the Amazon Prime documentary on the Duggar family and the fundamentalist program that they're a part of and it goes more into fundamentalist subcultures and then also a few documentaries on the Hillsong megachurch and its implosion and Kristen Covis Dumez showed up in several of the documentaries that I watched and I'd heard good things about this book so I decided my library had a copy in so I decided to pick it up and read it and this was a really great nonfiction book. So it's a little bit more on the academic side, but it documents the rise of white evangelical fundamentalism and talks about how at times it's working with mainstream American culture, but also it's uh, working, it, there's a friction there. And it also talks about muscular Christianity and how the fact that evangelicals and fundamentalists flocked to Donald Trump wasn't necessarily a surprise if you looked back on their history and how their elevated elevation of like quote unquote strong masculine figures uh, who don't always adhere to the values that evangelicalism and fundamentalism pro proclaim that they follow and it also talks about the white supremacy, the misogyny, and how all of this works together to create where we are, to end up where we are today. So I think what I really appreciated about this book was that it took a very long view of it. So it starts way back in the 19th century and it talks about, like I said, muscular Christianity and how a lot of what led to modern white evangelicalism and fundamentalism stemmed from Western expansion 
and the colonization of the American West <clears throat> and the view of make, proving yourself as a man in these instances. So yeah, I really enjoy, I actually like enjoy is not the word I would say I would use, but I thought that this was a really well written book. It was had a lot of really great um, analysis and it really helped explain, especially for someone who wasn't raised religious, um, but who grew up in a queer family and so was always very aware of how evangelicalism and fundamentalism impacted their family. Uh, I think this does a really good job of explaining that particular subculture. So I gave this 4.75 out of 5. I would really, again, recommend it if you're interested in learning more about like how we ended up the way that we are and how and why um, Donald Trump attracted the following that he did, especially now that we're heading into the next election cycle. After that, I read The Archive Undying by Emma Miyako Kandon. This is a science fiction slash almost science fantasy novel following this former priest of this AI god named Sunai. And in this world, AIs govern these cities and they're worshipped as gods. And there's a divide between those who have AI, these AIs and those who don't. And when AI, AIs, these AIs can become corrupted and it leads to the desolation of these cities and the priests, if they're interfacing with the AI, if they're connected to the AI, can also carry the corruption and become what's known as relics. And this governmental organization called the Harbor then takes these, these dead AIs and turns them into giant mechas called guardians. And these relics are essentially forced to pilot the. And then there's also like other artifacts uh, called frag tech. And so Sunai was uh, a priest of one of the gods and the god died. And what ended up happening was he became immortal and he's been kind of on the run and hiding ever since. And the story kicks off when he gets a letter from a former acquaintance basically saying, don't come home. And he gets roped into an expedition to search the ruins of one of these AI gods or these dead AIs. And things go from there. So this is a book where I understand why people did not, it did not work for people. It is very vibes based. It's, it doesn't hold your hand. It really throws you into the deep end. I was talking with someone in a discord server about this book and sh they also mentioned that it takes inspiration. It seems to take inspiration from a friends at the table campaign, which I have not listened to friends at the table. So I don't know how accurate that is, but this is very much a love letter about mechas, but it's also a commentary on the body and disability and body versus mind. And it's a really weird book. Like I just want to say it is a really weird book. And it's a book where you kind of have to accept that you're not, it's not going to explain things to you in ways that you might be used to books explaining it to you. So it is very confusing at times. It's one where like things keep twisting and uh, what you learn about people will kind of re recontextualizes what you think it, you know about them. And I overall liked it. I gave it a 3.5. I found that the world building and the characters worked for me. But again, I can understand why some people might, might not like it or why people would DNF because it is such a weird book that does not hold your hand. It does not give you time to ease in a lot of what I explained at the beginning of the story is things that I worked out and one of my other friends is reading it right now and she was like okay I think this is what it is but I'm not sure and I might have to reread it so it is a weird book I think there are times where Emma Mia Kokandan gets a little too into like the cool shit that's going on and it makes it difficult for readers to follow but I, like I said, I liked it. It was a 3.5 read for me. Um, I definitely want to reread it at some point because I think it's a book that 
once you have a general understanding of how the world works as well as seeing the endpoints to the characters and seeing where they end up give, gives you an understanding of like why they're acting the way that they do. One content warning I do want to give is body horror for this. There's especially towards the end there's just some body horror components so if that's not your jam don't read it um but if you're looking for kind of a weird mind fuck of a book that has a lot to say about disability and bodies and just what happens when you're mourning god pick it up just know that uh it might not work for you <laughs> Then I read Mickey Chambers Shakes It Up by Cherish Reed. This is a contemporary romance and it follows Mickey who is an adjunct professor at a local university and when her summer course load gets cut back in order to keep being able to pay for her thyroid medication, she takes a job at a local kind of dive bar, which is run by her other lead, Diego. So Diego is a widower. He's a grump grumpy man but with a very soft center and he is looking for new servers and he hires Mickey and they're very attracted to each other but the additional complication you know in it, like the other complication in addition to him being her boss is he's going back to school back to university as a promise to his deceased wife and Mickey is his professor and so they need to navigate that they need to na Diego is navigating you know kind of falling in love having a being attracted to someone about five years after his wife died and starting to move on Mickey is deal is tr is struggling with the fact that while she loves aspects of teaching the university that she teaches at doesn't love her back and so she needs to figure out what is best for her and what's the best use of her time and her energy and I really enjoyed this. So these are also two older protagonists. So Mickey is in her 30s and Diego is in his early 40s. I really liked that this was a grumpy sunshine, but it wasn't grumpy as in I hate everyone but you, but more grumpy in terms of I don't know how to properly express my emotions, but I do deeply care for the people around me. Like one of the first things that we, signs that we get that Diego has that soft center is he is fiercely protective of his staff. He, one of his staff members, her mom has a health event and he's like, you know, take all the time you need. We'll figure it out. We'll sort out the schedule. Just do what you need to do to take care of your family. And it was just, this is delightful. I loved the friends. I loved the family. I thought that the discussions about academia were way too real, uh, but it worked. I have read some of Cherish Reed's other novels and really liked it. And so I was just so happy that this one also turned out to be one that I enjoyed. I just really like her character work and the dynamics between the characters and even the bleak moment in this book worked for me. So I gave it a four stars. This was one of the better romances that I've read this year. And I recommend it if you're looking for a different shade of Grump Sunshine, uh, again, with some older protagonists and a character who has a disability in the form of hyperthyroidism. And then the last book that I read in July was Delicious in Dungeon Volume 2, written and illustrated by Ryoko Kui. This is the second volume in the manga series. And we're still following the adventuring group as they make their way down to the dungeon to rescue their companion who was eaten by a red dragon. And so in this book, we get some, dis or in this volume, we get discussions about the conflicts between orcs, humans, and elves, and just how e they view each other. And it, we get some, you know, character development for the orcs. We also learn more about the dungeon. Um, and Senshi, who is uh, this dwarf, we get golem farming, we get a kelpie, we get uh, paintings that suck you in. Yeah, this was fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've picked up the next two volumes because this is just something where it's a little bit different. It's short. I'm enjoying the art. I'm enjoying the characters. I like seeing how they're developing and getting little hints of their backstories. And yeah, I gave this four stars. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to seeing where the story is going and seeing what ends up happening to our group of adventurers when they finally find the red dragon. So that was my July. 
11 books, four DNFs, uh, some, some good, one bad. Yeah, it was overall pretty solid month for me, um, despite the fact that uh, the reading project took way longer than expected. So have you read any of the books uh, that I talked about today? Are, do you also go on nonfiction hyperfixations like I do? Please let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoy what you see, please like and, like and subscribe. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll talk with you later. Bye.